I thought about calling today's sermon the uh, Immaculate and Sacred Heart of the Savior. Instead, I went with the Heart of the Gentle Shepherd, a little easier, the Heart of the Gentle Shepherd. I want to ask a question, and it's not a trick question, but it's not as easy as you might think at first. Brothers and sisters, if you could know God, would you want to know him? Put aside the question of whether he's real or not. Put aside the question of, of uh, different theologies, different perspectives. I'm just asking you straight out, if you could know God, honestly, would you want to? It's kind of tough. Is there something in your soul? I mean, yeah, not on... I heard Bob say, not on my own. Amen, that's for sure. Don't want to stand before holy God on my own merit. Look at me, I'm good. No, not before holy God. But is there something in your soul that longs to hear from God? I mean, is there, are there days, are there moments where you just, I want, to, I want to hear from God. I want to know what's right. I want to know what's good. I want to know God's mind. I want to know his heart. Well, probably you're not here this morning unless on some level you say yes to that question. But honestly, there's something else at work in us, though. There's, there's something dark. We're, we're ambivalent. We're drawn to God and we're repulsed by God. Have you ever noticed that? We're drawn to God, but we are terrified of God, and we know that God is going to mess up my life. God's going to interfere with my life. We get close to God, you get close to the light, you start to see your hands are dirty. You live in the darkness, you don't have to say sorry for anything, you don't have to confess anything, you find the way you are. We get close to God, we start to see the nastiness inside, and that scares the heck out of us. So yes, yeah, I want to know God, and yeah, I really don't want to know God. I want to go and hide somewhere. I want to go underneath a rock somewhere. God, turn your gaze away from me. I'm a sinful person, I'm a sinful man. This is a real feeling deep inside, this, this pull, this gravity of the darkness, and it t- tugs us away from God. Or, You know, sometimes it's not just a gentle tug away from God. Sometimes we want to kick and scream and run for all we're worth in the opposite direction of God. Don't want to see a Bible. Don't want to see people pray. Don't want to sing. Don't want to go to church. Got to run. And as fast as I run, I turn around, God's right there. Today's message, the heart of the gentle shepherd, we're going to see what God's heart, what God's mind are all about, because you know what? God is a God of love. He didn't leave us without a witness. He didn't leave us with just my imagination or your imagination. He gave us this Bible. And this is like a love letter straight from heaven. You want to know God? We open up this Bible. You want to know his heart and his will for our lives? We see what he has for us. And if you don't think God would give us a Bible, what you're saying is that you don't think God loves us enough to care what we think about him. But the fact is, is that he died for us. He came down, he incarnated himself, he gave his life for us. He loves us and he wants us to know him. We don't have to just guess. Your guess is as good as mine. No, that doesn't cut it when we're dealing with heaven and hell and eternity and, and God. Does he care about us at all or not? It, it, what kind of a parent would he be If he made us and then didn't care. If he made us and left us abandoned without any answers. So today we're going to look at the heart of the gentle shepherd. It is my prayer. I want to know that heart. I want the heart of God to transform me. I want to be different because of the heart of God. It is my prayer that all of us in this room, all together, we come to see and understand and love the heart of Jesus Christ. We're studying this Bible because we want to love Jesus. We want to fall in love with our Savior. He made the first move that we could not. And now, the Word of God is calling us to respond to His love and His mercy. Let's open up our Bibles now to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, 
10 through 17. <clears throat> Remember, a synagogue was not the temple. It was kind of like a kind of like a Jewish church. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Now, there's some debate in uh, Jewish literature if a spirit is different than a demon. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, and so I'm just going to keep reading. And I really think that to put too much focus on spirit or demon or what's going on here. Uh, I heard some, a Christian pastor say, Jesus never laid hands on people with a demon. I don't know about that. Uh, and I think to focus on that is missing the point. Okay? So there is something at work here, an evil force, and this woman has been crippled. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Poor, poor gal. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up. And look at this. She praised God. Uh, Jesus Christ at work, immediately she straightens up, and she praises God. Indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Isn't that a sad verse right there? What are these guys so uptight about? What are they so upset about? The, Jesus just helps this woman who's been bent over for all these years and indignant, angry, they're peeved. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leaders said to the people, so he's not even talking to Jesus. He's saying, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on, on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what had bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. The heart of the gentle shepherd. You notice that his heart could speak gentleness to the woman who's been beat up by Satan. Beat up by Satan for 18 years. But he had a reprimand from the same heart. He had a reprimand from these so-called religious leaders who have love incarnate standing before them. Love in flesh, God himself standing in front of them, blessing this woman, saving her from the power of Satan. And all they have is they're angry because Jesus upset the apple cart. Jesus' words to them, by the way, were not hateful. They were truth. You hypocrites. You would take care of your own animals. This is a daughter of Abraham. Are you saying that I can't take care of her? He's trying to get them to repent, to change their way of thinking, to change their wicked ways. Imagine this woman, 18 years bent. When you're all bent over, you know, you're not seeing life from the perspective you're supposed to. It's all down like this. Not seeing things the way the world is really meant to be seen. And I'm guessing that that became the new normal for her. <laughs> After 18 years, she might not have remembered the right way of seeing the world. Satan had so beat her up. She was so used to seeing things when she was all bent over and crippled. She probably forgot what it was like to see things the right way. But you know what? She met Jesus, and he straightened her out. Brothers and sisters, that's what Jesus does. We met Jesus, and he straightens us out. If you don't want to be straightened out, you better... Tuck tail, run, because that's what God does. When we're being beat up by Satan, when our life is messed up, when we're miserable and, and, and we're not even seeing the world the right way, Jesus comes and he straightens us out. And when she straightened up, what did she do? She praised God. Come on. <laughs> Come on, right? That is good and proper. Praise God. Praise God. He straightened out a wretch like me. 
praise God, he said, Dan, you are going the wrong direction. Look at the mess you're making of your life. He turns me around, straightens me out. Have we met Christ? Have you gone to him for help? And has he straightened you up? We need more praising and less of everything else. More praising and less of everything else. God has been good to me beyond measure, and I'm ashamed that I find it so convenient and easy to complain. God has been good to me beyond deserving. Think about this. God, perfect God, died for me, was beaten, humiliated, spit upon, nailed to a cross, died for me so that I could have heaven, so that my sin, every wretched, nasty, despicable thing could be completely erased from God's ledger, be completely forgiven. Every breath after that is gravy. Every smile from a friend is gravy. Every time I get to come to church, it's above and beyond. I'm already getting what, way beyond what I deserve. I'm getting far beyond what I deserve. I'm getting heaven. Every other blessing. So, in other words, I got to work on this right between <laughs> these gray matter here between my ears because I ought not to be complaining so much. Everything else is gravy after the cross. The religious Pharisees were so tied up in tradition and legalism, and that's the way we do it. They couldn't even rejoice when God was doing something wonderful in their midst. That's what the blindness of sin brings. God's doing something big. God's doing something good, and you can't even see it. Lord, I know that can happen to me. Lord, I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to any of us in this room. We want to see the goodness of God at work. Let's not miss it. Our sin can stop us from seeing God at work. And what's more amazing, our religion can stop us from seeing God. Our religion can stop us from celebrating goodness. Our religion can stop us from caring about people in need. Now, how does that work? Well, it doesn't. That's not right. That's bad religion. And the gentle shepherd had strong words for people wrapped up in bad religion. Chapter 13, 18 through 21. We're going to finish up the chapter today. Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, this little tiny seed, the smallest one in that region. It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and he planted it in his garden, this little tiny seed, and it grew and became a a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. Just a little tiny beginning, and the birds are going to find rest in the branches of this tree. It's going to become something big and beautiful and strong. Again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like a little bit of yeast that the woman took, and he mixed it into 60 pounds of flour. So just a little yeast, but in this big, but see, it worked itself throughout the entire dough. Just a little start, and something great talks, comes from it. Uh, Jesus talking about the birds, those are people. In the kingdom of God, this is his teaching, his message. It's, it's the Bible, it's the, it's the fellowship, it's the church, it's all of this together. The kingdom of God starts with a small beginning, just Jesus' 12 apostles, and it grows and it grows and it grows, and the branches become a safe place. That's where the birds go. I once saw this really neat scene. I was, Dad was driving, I think. I was watching, and... Uh, Usually you see small birds like sparrows or robins go flying fast into trees, and their brains work so quick they could go full speed into a tree, and they're missing all the branches. They land right where they want. I saw the crow going 1,000 miles an hour right at this big tree, and I'm thinking, that crow is suicidal. Why would a crow be good? And then right behind it, the crow hits into the branches right behind his big old hop, goes up at a right angle. The cock didn't decide not to go into the tree at full speed. That crow thought my chances are better off (laughs) in the tree. Brothers and sisters, come to the kingdom of God. Let's find rest in the branches that God has made us, a safe place 
a safe place to build our lives, a place where birds make their home and have families. Did you know what? That was God's plan all along. Come to Jesus is where we build our life. This is where we find a safe place to grow our families. Small beginnings becomes this big, beautiful tree and all over the world today, in every single country on the planet, there are churches meeting. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus said it's a small start. Now, this is amazing prophecy. There were a lot of people alive 2,000 years ago. Jesus said it's going to have a small start, and it's going to become this great big tree, and everybody's going to come flocking to it in order to find a safe place, a place to grow and build their lives in God's plan in all over the world. We have brothers and sisters speaking all these different languages, and I can't, I can't wait to get to heaven and, and hear the music and the praise and, and to see everybody from all these different cultures. And you know what's the one constant? Saved by grace. Jesus Christ saved me. All these different countries, all these different cultures, generation after generation after generation. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 says, Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Do not despise these small starts. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begun. Isn't that neat? To see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Just get the plumb line to re get ready to start rebuilding things. Do not despise the day of small beginnings because it's easy to say, oh, I wish, I wish it was big. I wish it was greater than this. God says he rejoices to see the work started. We can make God happy when we start the work. You know, this, started, this church started with eight people in my folks' dining room. Well, that's not a real church. That's miserable. That ain't worth anything. God rejoices to see the work begun. Isn't that a comfort? Isn't that good to know? God looks down. He's cheering that little Bible study. You're just sharing your faith with your friend. Oh, it's just a seed. She'll probably never come to Christ. I don't know. God rejoices to see the work begun. Let's get out there and start working and give the Lord something to rejoice over. Uh, chapter 13, from verse 22. Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Wow. I start out by saying this morning, don't you wish you could just talk to God, ask him a question. Aren't you glad somebody asked him that question? And God in his grace said, you know what? I'm going to put that in the Bible for people. So this fellow said to Jesus, are, are only a few people going to be saved? Now how would religion answer that question? How would a televangelist who wants to be popular <laughs> answer that question? How, how would some theologians answer that question? Well, I don't, actually don't care. What I want to know is what Jesus said. And he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Now I want to warn you, be careful that you're not backpedaling real quick saying, well, that doesn't really mean what it says. We don't need to protect Jesus all the time. Let Jesus say what he wants to say. Let's be out the ones, we'll be the ones that change our thinking to conform to his. Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Jesus looks at him and says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. This is scary, right? What did, Jesus is scary. Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? You better make every effort to get right with God better make every effort to get in through that narrow door because once the owner closes the door, you're going to be knocking and pleading. He says, go away, I don't know you. And then you will say, we ate and we drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from, away from me, all you evildoers, which that's the worst thing you could ever hear. The worst thing you could ever hear. The best thing you could ever hear is come into me, enjoy my rest. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The worst thing you could hear from God is, away from me, all of you evildoers. God is everything good, everything wonderful, everything beautiful. You love nature. That's God who made it, you know. We love love and laughter and beauty, all things God made. 
when you're sent away from God, we're sent going away from everything good. There's no joy in hell. Don't think it's going to be a party. Parties are God's creation. God made everything good. He says, get away from me, all you evildoers. And then look at what Jesus says. There will be weeping there. What is hell like? Is it a party? There's going to be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. And then look what Jesus says. This prophecy. Jesus, a Jewish Messiah, talking to a Jewish audience. But people are going to come from the east and the west and the north and the south. And today I told you all over the world, Christianity is the only religion in every country in the world. Uh, there's Bibles translated into almost every uh, language in the world. People will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and the first will be last. Again, it's so easy to read that and not realize that's amazing prophecy that has been fulfilled. The gospel has gone out into the entire world and there's people in Japan <laughs> as far as far east as you can go without getting your feet dipped in the ocean, right? There are people in, in the middle of Africa, South America, uh, North America, the Eskimos in Alaska. Everywhere you go, there are people who are praising Jesus. And Jesus prophesied that. In the same context, he said, and you better make sure you don't miss it. It's going to be a big party. There's going to be people from everywhere coming. Don't miss it. Some of this is uh, confusing. And you don't have to understand everything to get a lot out of the scriptures, amen? It's, it, we don't pretend like we understand everything. <clears throat> but a couple of things are really clear. When the owner closes the door, no one else is getting in. It's kind of like when the doors of the ark were closed, right? And Noah didn't close the doors. God closed the doors to the ark. When the doors are closed, no one else is getting in. There is a time to get in. The Bible says there's a time for everything under heaven. There's a time to get in. And if you miss that time, you miss out on what? On everything. You miss out on everything. Please note and please do not miss this. In his love, Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the gentle shepherd, he did not say, hey, don't worry, everyone gets in. He did not say everyone gets saved. There is a lie from hell. There is a lie from hell. And the purpose of this lie is to keep people from getting right with God. It's common. It's common nowadays. It's made popular by people like Oprah Winfrey and Rob Bell. And it says that all religion leads to God. Everything leads to God. If you're sincere, you'll be okay. Everyone gets to heaven. You know what? I've got a choice. Rob Bell or the scriptures? I've got a choice. And by the way, Rob Bell didn't die for me. <laughs> Jesus died for me. And he, I know he loves me. And he says, get right with the living God. It's not how the Bible is written. If everyone gets saved, then Jesus' answer doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Brothers and sisters, have you ever struggled that maybe everybody goes to heaven? If everyone is saved, you tell me what Jesus is saying. It doesn't make any sense. If everyone gets saved, then the Bible's written wrong. If everyone gets in, what could it possibly mean? Make every effort to get in because once the owner closes the door, it's too late. I don't want to have a theology that I have to do some weird contortions and, and acrobatics to make it all fit. I just want to read it at straight value, see what the Lord says. Strive, another translation says, New American Standard. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door... And you begin to stand outside, knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you're from. So who are the people who want to get in but can't? The people that are on the outside once the door is closing. God has given you an opportunity to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus now because the door is open now. 
Everybody who tries to find the Lord, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, will be saved. The people who are on the outside is when God has closed the door, when there's no more opportunity. When we die and stand before the judgment seat of God, there is no more opportunity to bed and plead. plead. Get right with the Lord now. Then you will say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will, he will say, this is from the heart of the gentle shepherd. This is flowing from the heart of God. I do not know where you're from. Depart from me, all of you evildoers. Goodness itself saying, you got to go away. That is heartbreaking. In that place, Jesus, and why is he telling us, oh, he just wants to scare us? He's telling us this because he doesn't want anybody to go there. He's telling us this because he's trying to gather all people to himself. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves have been cast out. Jesus also didn't say to the man who asked, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He, he also didn't say, and even if we were to send down angels unto them, and if the dead were to speak to them, and even if we were to assemble before them face to face all the things that can prove the truth, they would still not believe unless God so willed. But in this, most of them are entirely unaware. You know why Jesus didn't say that? Because that's from the Quran, Surah 6, 111. I've got a Quran at home. I don't know if you're supposed to write in it, but I write in my Bible. I've written in the Quran and taken notes, and there are tons of verses just like this. Surah 7, 178. He who Allah leadeth, he indeed is led aright, while he whom Allah leadeth astray, they indeed are losers. The great Christian philosopher, Norman Geisler, if you haven't heard of him, I recommend you check him out if you're into apologetics and philosophy. In his book, Answering Islam, notes that in Islam, God does not want all people to be saved. Isn't that funny? In Islam... God does not want all people to be saved. What's up with that? Norman Geisler notes God's love and his mercy seem to be arbitrary. And he quotes the Muslim philosopher, uh, I'm going to mangle this name, Al-Ghazali, uh, who wrote, He, God, willeth also the unbelief of the unbeliever. God decides the unbelief of the unbeliever and the irreligion of the wicked. And without that, there would be neither unbelief nor irreligion. So in Islam, if God didn't will you to unbelieve, there would be no, be no unbelievers. That's interesting. All we do, all we do, all we do, we do by his will. And what he willeth not does not come to pass. If one should ask why God does not will that all men should be saved, that's a good question, right? He's saying, if, God, if, if somebody wants to ask, why doesn't God will that all men to be saved? Which, incidentally, is what the Bible teaches, right? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 tells that God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. But Al-Ghazali says, if one should ask why God does not will that all men should believe, we answer, we have no right to inquire about what God wills or does. He is perfectly free to will and do what he pleases. Compare this to what the prophet Ezekiel carried along by the Holy Spirit of God says in Ezekiel 33:11, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they will turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why do you die? Hear God's plead. Turn, repent from your ways. Turn to me. I don't want you to die. He's talking about eternal death, right? We're talking about hell. The beautiful heart of God, the immaculate and sacred heart of God, struggles with fallen humanity that they would turn from their sins and choose God. That was the message of the book of Hosea, remember? God wooing and striving to win the hearts of sinful people. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, certain that God is appealing through us we plead on christ's behalf be reconciled to god see how different it is from islam we're pleading with you be reconciled to god 
the guy comes to Jesus, is everybody going to save? Jesus says, strive, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. And in Romans 2, chapter, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 4, in the New Living Translation, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, patient God is with you? Don't you see how wonderfully patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Brothers and sisters, the narrow door is impossible to get through without effort. I'll just sit here. Jesus said, the door's over there. I'm going to sit here, thank you. Now, in Sunday school class, we talked about how nobody can save themselves. And it is absolutely true. God made the door. And then Ephesians tells us we're saved by grace so that no one can boast. There is no bragging in being saved out of a pit. I'm in the bottom of a pit and I can't save me. And God comes over the side and says, grab a hold of this rope. I sacrificed everything for you. Grab a hold of it. And you, you grab a hold of that rope and you're on the outside. Look at me how awesome I am. Does that make sense to anybody? There's no room for boasting. We are at the bottom of the pit, and if God didn't first come to us in love and offer this nail-scarred hand, there would be no escape for us. Strive, make every effort to get through that narrow door. God is calling everybody to him. Do not mistake his, his patience. His patience is to give us time so we can see his goodness, so we would turn to God. Can't you see the kindness of God is intended for you to turn away from darkness to light? The narrow door is hard to get through, impossible without effort. What are some of the things that might keep us from going through the narrow door? Pride. That's what caused Satan to fall. That's the biggie. In fact, pride is the catalyst for all the other sins. Pride. What else, what else might keep us from, from getting through that narrow door? Pride. Ignorance, just not knowing lust of the flesh. I'm going to get to that one in a bit. That's a biggie. Gluttony. You know, our, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, potluck, both tonight and tomorrow, there's going to be some glutton-free, or gluten-free if you read it with one T. But gluttony uh, can keep, yeah, I think that's actually true. Yeah. What else? Selfishness. Doubt. Selfishness. Selfishness, self-righteousness. Idolatry. Idolatry, putting other things, <laughs> making them the center of our heart and lives above Christ. What's up over here? Wrath, anger, bitterness, busyness. I'm too busy to think about God. I'm too busy to read my Bible. I'm too busy to go to church. You ain't too busy. This is the most important thing there is. You ain't too busy for this. If you are, it's being foolish. Rationalization because we are self-deluded. Uh, the Bible says wealth. Greed, money is the root of all sorts of evil. Did you know that blessing, when we forget to put our eyes on the blesser, that blessings can take us away from God? Because now I worry about my house, I worry about my car, I worry about all these things I've got, and I forget to give my time and heart and mind to the Lord. Popularity. Popularity is such a trap. I've got people patting me on the back, and they're going to look down at me if I talk about Jesus. I've got people who think I'm cool, and they're, you know, not me, but I'm saying hypothetically. There are people who, who, who just everybody's, get, they've got the adulation of everybody and they stand so much to lose if they speak about Jesus Christ because then people might walk away from them. Pride, anger. I'm so full of anger. I've got a good angry on. I don't want to forgive these people. And when I get close to Jesus, I see what a jerk I am. I want to be angry. I want to hold on to unforgiveness. I want to be bitter. Anger can keep you from the narrow door. False, go false gods, idolatry, politics. If I think there's some uh, politics is going to be my savior, you know what? Uh, drugs are increasingly becoming a horrible thing. Uh, the problem with drugs is they mess with your mind and they make you dependent and you stop thinking about getting right with God and all you think is about getting your next fix. And what did I say about the people who are knocking on, saying, let me in, let me in? Who are they? They are the dead. When you're alive, you still have a chance to turn and repent. 
drugs kill at an alarming rate. The heroin abuse in the United States is, is so, so tragic, and my heart breaks, and it's not just a physical ailment. It's not just a physical sickness. It's separating people from God. It's separating people from God, and we need to love people enough. We don't need to look down at them. We don't need to pull some self-righteous, holier-than-thou crap. We need to get down next to people, put our arms around them, and love them close to Jesus. Drugs steal people away from heaven, and I'm sick of it. And Josh McDowell, the popular philosopher and apologist, who's always taking on intellectual arguments, just in the last few weeks, he came out with something amazing. He said, I have come to believe, listen to this, words of Josh McDowell, I have come to believe that the greatest barrier to the gospel in our culture is not intellectual, and here's the quote, instead, the greatest threat to the cause of Christ is pervasive sexuality and pornography. Because people want their porn. People want illicit sex. They want to run around outside their marriage. And you get close to God, and he's always looking over your shoulder. And he's uncomfortable. And he's saying, thou shalt not. And you were saying, who the heck are you to tell me? Oh, yeah, God. <laughs> who do you think you are? Oh, yeah, God. And so people change their theology. Well, God just made me this way. Whatever he willeth, I got to do with, you know, like Islam. So I'm not responsible for my sins. And, and, and people run away from God because they don't want him looking over their shoulder. And pretty soon, one famous atheist once said, a bunch of us turned away from God so we could have sex outside of marriage. And as a beneficial side effect, we were right that there was no God. But what was it that motivated them to run away from God? They wanted to run away from the goodness of God, the rules for God, the God, the God who says, this is the way I want my children to live. Quit playing in the streets. Uh, we, think, we think this stuff is not that big a deal, and it's putting up walls, and our young generation can't see Jesus. They don't want to see Jesus anymore because they want to do their thing. And when you have this intellectual philosopher saying, I don't think it's logical arguments anymore, I think it's illicit sex and pornography, I think there's brilliant insight there. People are running away from God because they want to do their own thing. Brothers and sisters, strive and help people you love to enter that narrow gate. And if you don't love the people, you should love your neighbor. <laughs> and if you say they're my enemy, you should love your enemies. <laughs> So help the people you love and the people in your sphere of influence. In fact, everyone you meet, help them to enter that narrow gate. Let's finish up the chapter now, 31 through 35. <clears throat> and if you're wondering why I'm not doing a three-point sermon, it's because the Bible wasn't written that way, okay? <laughs> We're just going on what comes next. Uh, verse 31, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. What a horrible thing to say to God. Have you ever said that in your heart? God, get out of here. God, I don't want to see you. Well, you know what we usually do? We usually run away from church. <laughs> don't go to Bible study. Don't pray. Uh, that's the same thing. Get away from here. Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons. <laughs> oh, man. This is macho stuff. The king wants to kill you. You go tell that fox, I'm going to keep casting out demons. I'm big time. <laughs> He's got, I've got bigger things to do. I will keep on driving out demons and helping people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. He's going to the cross, right? In that case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. And then listen to these words, the gentle heart of our shepherd jerusalem jerusalem you who kill the prophets and stone those that god sends to you how often have i longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you will not have it look your house is left to you desolate <coughs> i tell you you not see me again until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You guys kill the prophets. You guys kill my messengers. So what does he say? I cannot wait to hammer you guys and send you to hell. 
You guys kill my prophets. You guys kill the good people I send you. And he says, out of the goodness of his heart, I can't, I just yearn to gather you like children under, the, under my wings. I want to protect you. I want to give you a safe spot. I wish you could know how good it would be doing your life with me. But look at now your house is desolate. Look at the mess you've made of your life. Look at how you've ruined your life running away from me. Look at the dead end you've, you've, you have because of the foolish choices you've made, how you ran away from God. God says, I want to gather you together under my wings. You're not going to see me until you learn to say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You're not going to see Jesus until you start blessing his name. There was an old proverb uh, I learned, uh, an old Jewish proverb that Jesus was probably referring to when he said, you tell that old fox. And the Jewish proverb is funny, and it's practical. It's from a human point of view. This is not Bible. It's from a human point of view. It says, worship the fox in his time. Meaning, honor the man when he's in his prime or when, he has all, when his wealth is at his zenith. Pay attention to him. Honor him because that will be beneficial to you. When the fox is in all his glory, you come and say, oh, what a wonderful fox you are. Because he's got the money and the power. And Jesus says, you tell that old fox, wallowing in his wealth and power, that my life is my own. I'm casting out demons here. I control when and where I die, and I will not be stopped by him or anybody else from completing my task, and I'm not going to fawn over him or fear him. I'm a busy man. That's exactly what Jesus said to Herod. And then listen to the anguish, the sadness in his heart again, the heart of the gentle shepherd. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that were sent to her. How often, this is not Jesus, the 32-year-old. This is Jesus, God incarnate, who over the centuries, the millennia, has been looking over Jerusalem, and his heart is breaking for that city. His heart's breaking for Chicago, too, and New York, and Washington, and D.C. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets, and you stone those that I sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. You would not have it. What sad words when God wants to love you, and you won't have it. And you're going to be out there knocking when it's too late. Put our nation's name in there. America, America, why do you fight against me? I want to bless you. I want to protect you under my wings like a mother hen protects her chicks, but you won't have me. Put your own name in there. Sometimes we fight against God, but look at his heart. Oh, Dan, oh, Daniel, Daniel, the one who resists me and runs on his own merry way, why do you stand so far away from me? How I have longed to bring you back to my side just as a hen gathers her children under her wings and you won't have it. I don't want that to be true of me. When I screw up, I want to run to grace. I don't want to run away from the love of God. Lord, help me, and help me to want this more than anything else. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for opening up that gate. Thank you for calling all of us to enter in. Lord, Thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy. Lord, help me to desire you more than anything else. Help me to praise you, Lord, above everything else. Lord, I don't want to be full of anger. I don't want to be full of bitterness. I want to, want to be full of greed or lust or envy. All these things come easy to me, God. I don't want to be full of frustration. I don't want to be, keep... Be full of long lists of how other people have disappointed me, Lord. Oh, so horrible. All the nastiness, Lord. Please free me from that. I want to walk in your goodness. I want to walk in your light, Lord. I want to see you as you really are. I want to, I want to draw close to your side, Lord. Thank you for your cross that paid for all of my sins. Thank you that I can know beyond doubt, Lord, that I am forgiven because of the blood of your son, Jesus. Lord, help me now to walk with you, to live for you, and to share this message of the kingdom. Help me, Lord, to do this more faithfully to everyone I can. And Lord, help our entire church to be like a lighthouse, each one of us shining the love of Jesus wherever we go. Thank you for this time, Lord, and Lord, we really want to
praise you and thank you for letting us have Chet and Rachel all these years. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.